welcome to my channel, Haley Marie Vintage. Today I have a very spooky Halloween themed sewing project for y'all. I'm really, really excited about this one. I've been thinking about this one for a little over a year and I'm ready to head for sewing. My week at work has been unhinged. I'm feeling unhinged. I feel like my hair looks slightly unhinged. It fits the mood and I'm really ready to head to the happy place of my sewing. So let's talk about what I'm doing for you guys today. This is the pattern. It is a ball gown. It is Simplicity 1770. It has this really beautiful dress that then you make an overskirt for that you can remove, which is pretty neat. And why I chose to do this is it makes this dress hopefully a little bit more year round for me. Looking for the description. The dress has a strapless boned bodice to which soft gathered trim is tacked. Skirt is gathered, full over skirt is gathered to band and has tight ends. View one features floor length skirts. That's not what I'm doing. That would be really expensive. And then view two over skirt is contrast fabric with band and tie ends at dress fabric. So that is what we're doing. We're doing view number two, which is super cute and short. The reason I chose this pattern was the kind of gathered fun. I feel like I think of them as like princess Ariel uh, vibes that are on the top of this dress, but that might be the wrong reference because I am not super up on my Disney. But for fabrics, I'm really excited. I picked this up. This is a taffeta by Silk Baron and it is a green, spooky, a green purple color shift. It's called Joker. I think they did sell out of it. I think I got the last yardage. It's super beautiful and I can't wait to use it. And I'm hoping you can kind of see what this looks like on camera. So that is my first fabric, which will be the base dress. And then the overskirt, I saw Bianca of the Closet Historian make something with this last year. And I really like this fabric. It's like a sparkly spider web. It's just a little bit nicer than what you can find at Joann's this time of year, which are often like more flocked. So those are the two fabrics that I'm using. So basically I'm kind of making a updated dress. I, I will link it down below, but this is from, I think my first year of my YouTube channel where I sewed a spider dress that was green with a black overlay. And I feel like this is going to be kind of like my updated new sewing journey version of this. I have grown a ton in my sewing and I recently had to declutter that spider web dress because because of my weight fluctuations. So I said goodbye to it, which is totally fine because it's an early part of my sewing. And now I'm gonna say hello to this. I have three weekends to do this, which is good because since work has been stressful, not fun, I've been screaming into pillow after it, not every day, but often. But since work has been like that, my body is really flared up. I'm having really bad back spasms. My IBS is acting up and my eczema is acting up. So all of those things are gonna make this project a lot slower for me because I'm gonna be just dealing with more pain than I usually do. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that work starts to slow down. My motto this week at work was, this is out of scope of my job description. So I'm hoping that will help to tamper things at work, but I'm fine. Anyway, I'm excited to sew this. Yeah, I have three weekends so I can totally pace myself. My goal this first weekend is the bodice. My goal the second weekend is to make the skirt and complete the dress. And then my goal the third weekend is to make the, the spiderweb overskirt. So I feel like I have this really spread out nicely. I will note that Silk Baron, I bought eight yards of this fabric, but they only had six and a quarter in stock. So I am gonna have to figure out how to adapt the skirt down to be just a tiny bit less flared. Having that little bit of work each weekend should work because I would anticipate the bodice taking me four to five hours. I would anticipate the skirt and finishing the dress to probably take an additional four to five Five hours because the dress itself is not that complicated and then I will also anticipate the skirt actually probably the overlay taking even shorter time are you gonna come say hi yeah spooky has been my serotonin I think that's the right right thing or yeah it's not endorphins I think it's my serotonin she's been my serotonin bo boost during this um interesting time in my work life so it's been very good to have her but I'll stop rambling about how cranky I am and instead we will hop back into my happy place of sewing first things first I am starting by cutting out the skirt so I don't actually have enough fabric because of that unplanned shortage to cut these exactly the way as planned so instead i'm going to cut them from selvage to selvage all the way across you'll see me move it and as always spooky is very interested in the silk and so i have moved her water and food bowls up so she can't put her paws in them and then walk on my silk because that would make me deeply unhappy and then once i finish cutting the these two pieces i will then move on to the bodice pieces 
The bodice pieces are all pretty straightforward, but they do have a lot more markings, such as darts and things. And again, Spooky is invested. This only consists of four small pieces, the front bodice, back bodice, and facings. And then this bigger piece that you see here, that is like the decor that goes on at the end. And then while I wrap up, cutting this out. I just want to remind you that I do have a Ko-Fi where you can go over and buy me a coffee if you so desire. I put a lot of time and labor into this channel and so I always really appreciate it when someone buys me a coffee. So here I am marking out my darts and then I will pin them making sure to match those chalk lines to each other on each side so that way it is even. And then after sewing them, I am pressing them. Usually I press these like to the center or to the side, but I'm actually trying to kind of smush these down the middle because this will be eventually how I sew on the boning. And so it's better that it's like the middle of the dart as opposed to like the side of the dart, I think. This is my own guess. I have no actual idea or proof. And then with those done, I'm gonna sew up the side seams. One I am prepping for a normal French seam and the other I am prepping for being the zipper. Usually I will move a side zipper to the back but since this is kind of a strapless dress I don't anticipate it being as hard to get on and off so I'm going to go ahead and follow through with the side zipper. And then after sewing these, I'm going to press them. And then I get to unpick all my work. Unfortunately, I realized a little bit too late that I did my French seams incorrectly. So I now need to unpick everything and do them the opposite way. And of course I figured this out after I had already trimmed the seams. So this was good fun. But I did indeed get the seams running the correct way. And here I am stitching those down. You can see that this is an enclosed seam because I trimmed down the original seam and then now I have it right sides together sewing and that seam is just completely enclosed. It's French seams are brilliant. And then I am finally actually pressing that in place now that everything's correct. Next step is to figure out the boning according to the directions. The directions say to cut boning the length of each dart. So the back darts will go actually all the way up to the neckline or back line. And then the front darts will just go to the top of the bottom dart. And the sides, of course, will run all the way up the sides to the neckline again. I am using this boning that my friends picked me up at a garage sale, like technically featherweight, but it's definitely old and there is a little bit of, I think, water staining. After I cut these, I'm measuring 7 eighths of an inch in marking, which is what the instructions say to do. This mark is to show where I actually want to cut the boning and then leave the encasing further along. And then once that's marked, I am seam ripping that up to the top of the bone covering, and then I am cutting the bone, making sure to make it a nice rounded edge so it won't be pointy or sharp, which all of these are specified in the instructions. And then the instructions say to like fold it over and stitch it down, but it feels really bulky if I do that. So instead I am just zigzag stitching these close on the end and I will actually be sewing these into some seams because I just think that's gonna be a much narrower finish than what they're asking me to do. And of course, since it's silk, Spooky is well and around because she loves silk so much, but here I'm just hand stitching on the boning. Here, Spooky also is curious about the boning. She's a little bit ridiculous, but I love her so much. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. I'm just kind of like zigzag stitching back and forth and picking up only like a couple threads of the fabric on each side, trying to stay on the seam allowance or the dart as much as possible, but for a couple of these, they start to go off. With that done, I now get to work on the facings. So here I am just stitching the side seams of the facings together. Only on one side though, I double and triple checked this was going to be the correct side, since obviously I have to have one side open for the zipper. And then I did these a quarter hem, like turnover thing that you can see here, and then I am stitching in my Spooky and Haley label, and I am stitching this into the facing it will be about an eighth of an inch below where this actually gets sewn. Uh, you'll see what I mean in a little bit. But I'm just trying to remember to put in my labels. I'm proud of what I make. I want them to be able to be traced back to me. And now it's time to pin the facings together. I got everything right and was very pleased with myself because that doesn't always happen. From there, I am clipping all of my curves really carefully. And then I am also going to completely clip and cut off those corners. I did some back stitching along them to make sure they keep nice and sharp. I don't know if that's effective, but I feel like it worked pretty well for this project to give them a little bit more strength. 
And then after clipping my corners, I am of course, you guessed it, understitching. So here I am understitching as far as I can to each edge because of these sharp points. I can't actually fully understitch everything, but I'm just trying to do as good as I can because this helps so significantly in the finish of your garment. And now I am turning the facings and getting them all pressed and they look very, very, very good. I am pleased. It is another day and time to start on the skirt. Here I am just sewing the side seams. You'll get to see very quickly that this is a massive amount of fabric. This skirt is so full. Like, look at this. I'm just throwing it around. It's like me size and silk. And then I'm pressing these seams open. I cut these with the selvage, so I don't need to finish these seams, which is super nice. But also I thought you would enjoy. You can see the color shift really well in this shot, as well as the mess in my background. Shh. After the press, I'm real quick unpicking where the zipper will go in. And now it's time for me to put in the gathering stitches. This is just two rows of stitches I make, one at three eighths of an inch, and then the other one as far down as I can go with like my foot. I have it set on zero with that three eighths then running against the foot. I think that makes it about six eighths wide, but I'm not totally sure. But regardless, this is how I choose to gather. I've gone down from three rows to two rows, so I have gotten a little bit less intense about it. But this took forever. I Gathering this was boo. Here I am actually gathering this down. This was so challenging actually because these, I actually had to get them the tightest they would go to be able to fit them to the bodice. So this is no joke of a gathered skirt. The reason I do two lines of stitching isn't just because I think it gives a neater gather, but also because it gives strength with how much I had to yank on these. I normally don't mind gathering, but I have to say I really hated gathering for this project. And then with the bodice sewn to the the skirt I am then going through with a seam rayon seam binding to bind that waist seam for a finish. This doesn't add much bulk on what is already a pretty bulky seam and I happen to have rayon tape that was like a pretty decent match. And then after that it is time for me to sew in the zipper. This I just did my usual method of no pins going down and around. This zipper definitely ended up a little bit uneven but it's whatever. I'm fine with it. It's a side zip, so it's under my armpit, and if anyone's looking that hard, that's not a me problem. And it is now a few days later after work. I am first starting by just cleaning up the hemline by doing a quarter inch fold. The dress called for a two inch seam allowance here, but I felt like the length was really long on me when I tried it on, so I went ahead and I used four inches. This should also give good weight to pull the taffeta down. The taffeta is very like Floaty is like the wrong word. The taffeta is pretty structured and stiff, so it like just does weird things. So I actually think more weight in the hem is not a bad idea. I actually think this would be a good example on a piece that actually would probably be good to install hem weights, but I don't have those on hand. And now it is hand stitching time. I am just sewing that down using those stitches that are like fairly invisible from the front where you just pick up a little bit and then you push it through the hem. This took forever because there was so much skirt on this dress, but I did get through it. And then after that, I needed to go ahead and sew in the last bone that's on the zipper line. I kept putting this off because the zipper line can be kind of hard to sew through. So I was putting it off and I did kind of use my rubber thimble. I am really bad at using a thimble though, just in general, but you can see me uh, kind of using it there. And then once that's done, I am installing some hanger strap things. I like to install these pointing down so they actually stay in the garment. I find one of the problems with why they stick out so much in modern garments is they're sewn to stick up, as opposed to if you sew them to stick down and so that way they only stick up when they're on the hanger and like gravity's doing its thing. I'm putting these in because I don't wanna hang this by the decoration because I expect that to be kind of like hand stitched on. And then I'm stitching this on a facing and boning so that way it is nice and sturdily in there and not yanking on a part of the gown that is not good to yank on. Alrighty, good morning. It is, I think, the next weekend from 
when I last worked on this, I did do some hand stitching and stuff the, like over the evenings in the week. I do have basically a dress happening here. This is it. It's looking really good. I really like this silk. I wasn't sure about this material, but the more I work with it, the more I like it. So that's nice. The fit is really, really good on this. I've already tried it on. Everything's looking really good. I will say I'm feeling very like low motivation to sew today and probably tomorrow. I have just like a lot big social lots of plans weekend type thing happening. So with that, I am just kind of dragging my feet a little on sewing. My goal probably by the end of this weekend is to basically only get the uh, decorative trim on and maybe cut the other skirt. I don't think the other skirt's gonna take me that long to make. I do have a time limitation on this project that I do have to kind of figure out how to get motivated and get it done because I am leaving for Argentina soon and I'll be gone a few weeks. And the only reason I'm saying this is I will be back from Argentina by the time this video goes up. So I do have to like get this done. This isn't a project that I can just kind of let languish for a while. So I'm going to try to re re get into sewing and do some things. I only have about an hour this morning to work and then I'll probably have a couple hours this evening to work. So we'll see what we can get done. But yeah, I am pretty close to this dress. I'd like to get this dress done in time for Fractales because I actually think I want to like test it by wearing it to that event. That is on Friday. So I do have to at least get the base of the dress done by Friday. So yeah, that is I guess the scoop on everything and I'm gonna uh, get to work. So let's just... Now it is time for me to figure out this big decorative piece. First, it has me sew down the like short -er line. This is where like a basically cross seam will be. I'm not gonna be able to explain this while I'm telling you already, but I am sewing that edge down first as the instruction states. It's the one with two notches. And then with it sewn and pressed, I am now going to stitch down the long side like it instructs me to. So this will be kind of like a long tube. And then I will press that seam. You can see that cross seam there too and enjoy the color shiftiness here. It's really nice in this lighting. Just uh, popping in to say hi here because look at how wild that teal and purple difference is because I clearly sewed these kind of the wrong opposite way, but it's okay. They look fine on the final garment. And then I'm just using this pattern piece to check where my fold lines are just because I was a little confused how the folding was supposed to work. So I'm folding it with the seam down the middle, which will be the backside, I think, of the decoration. And then I am getting ready to stitch these together, which will then give me like a complete circle. Hopefully visually this makes sense to you. I then foolishly folded it in half, which is not what you're supposed to do. And so then I had to unpress that before moving on to the final stage of this garment. After this, I'm using the pattern piece again to try to figure out exactly where the gathering lines went. And then I'm going to pin these before then marking each of the pins with a little bit of white chalk and then drawing a line in between them. This line is on the inside or what will be against my skin so it will not show and also chalk just kind of flakes off. It's actually quite irritating sometimes. Wow, look at this amazing footage of me sewing the basting stitches in for the gathering on those white lines. So what I'm doing first is I am sewing it on the white line down the middle and then I will sew to like an eighth of an inch on each side of that to give me again the strength I will probably need to pull this because this fabric has gotten real bulky real fast. I actually think that it could have been like half the width and would have still given the same effect with a lot less bulk. And then I'm starting to gather these down. I am going to gather them down the best I can, but because of the thickness of the material, my gathering stitches weren't as long as desired. And also like this was just like, you can see the force I'm using on this. This is not a normal amount of gathering force. I think in retrospect, I should have just done these by hand. Retrospect is retrospect and I did not do them by hand. And so instead I suffered and I could not get these down as tight as they were supposed to be. That basically took up that evening. So now I am on another evening after work working on this project so they want me to cut a 23 inch long strip of fabric that is also one and a quarter inches wide this is going to be for the little like things that go around the gathering to cover how ugly they are which is not what the instructions say but mine turned out really ugly and need to be covered and then I just am folding that down and they instruct you to do a quarter inch seam allowance which I did my best with and then I turned around using the good old safety pin trick that was fun I guess and then once I had gotten that all turned, I am 
ironing it with the seam down the back so it won't be visible so it won't be visible at all from the front from there it has you cut it into six pieces which is what i did here and then I am stitching those on. So I am basically just like folding it over and then stitching that around with the non-stitched part being the front side of this. And as you can see, I like really needed to regather this. So actually what I did before I even put the things on is I just hand gathered it down to the appropriate width before then uh, attaching the little tabby cover your mistakes thing. Once that was done, I am now sewing this onto where it goes, following the instructions. So basically where the two seams are, that's the front and the back because the pieces on the arms are just a tiny bit longer. Actually, in retrospect, I would have made those a little bit even more longer for my arms because they are not the thin arms of the 50s lady. But this was also not very fun. I have to say this silk taffeta, once you get a bunch of layers together, is not fun to sew through. With the main dress done, I can finally work on the skirt. What I'm doing first is I actually measured all the pieces I would be using for the overskirt and then I translated that basically to yardages and then I measured out exactly how many yards I would need before cutting down the side. I'm just doing this because I'm just going to have have no seams in the overskirt. I don't see a reason to have seams in the overskirt. It seems like it would take more time and not be worth the effort. And then I'm cutting against that hard embroidery line of the tool to get rid of the plain tool. And also I kind of like the idea of that hard line being at the bottom. I think it will add an interesting detail. And then from there, I'm trying 20 different ways to figure out how exactly to measure this to be 36 or 33 inches which this was, this was a struggle. I'm not gonna lie. Here's spooky coming to make it more of a struggle. But I was trying to cut it all evenly at 33 inches and I found that very challenging because of how stretchy the mesh is. So this was a whole journey. You'll see how I even it out in a hot sec. When placing the curved edge that I did cut, cut of course that curved edge, I then realized what I actually needed to do was use this piece to level out everything. I just kind of scooted it along and cut off the top. I was about any anywhere from one to three inches off the actual height of this piece. So B minus D, I don't know, bad grade for me on this. So I caused myself a whole lot more work. And then I got to cut out the waistband, which I did from this velvet that I used in a project last year. I kept this velvet, like all the scraps and stuff because I thought it might come in handy for another project. And here we are. Cutting this velvet was a relief after cutting that mesh. I'm first starting by getting my ties ready to sew up. These are pretty straightforward. You just fold them in half and then they go and get sewn. Um, these are really long ties though, I will say that. Wow, wow, wow. Then I'm gonna clip these corners and get this ready to turn, which turning this was pretty easy. Velvet is pretty slippery, especially because I made sure to buy rayon velvet when I bought velvet, which is a lot more expensive, but man, it is nice to work with comparatively. And then I'm very, very, very lightly pressing the velvet with a press cloth between it and the iron. No like steam, no nothing. Trying not to flatten the pile without having a like $200 tool, which is like the like velvet boards. I don't work with velvet enough and I don't like working with velvet enough to ever own one of those. Since I cut this with a black line at the bottom, I feel like it's basically already hemmed except for where the curves are. So I'm just doing a narrow double turn hem here. And then it's time to do a million more gathering stitches. Here, what you see me doing, the reason you see me yanking it from the back is I'm just holding the thread to keep it from pulling and like pre-gathering on me. So that way I can get a cleaner gather at the end. Gathering it all to the waistband, I used the folding it into quarter system to make sure my gathers are even all the way around. Man, gathering netting is so much easier. Here I am sewing the ends of the waistband to the ties. You can see I'm just doing that on like the half. This is how the instructions say to do it. I can't say this is how I personally would have done it, but you follow the rules the first time you make a pattern often. And now I am pinning this to get it ready for hand sewing. So I'm just folding all of my edges in on the waistband. It's always so hard to see what I'm doing in black, but I promise I'm making all my edges clean. I started sewing and then of course I had a spooky intrusion. So once she's settled, I am just hand stitching 
the waistband down using slip stitches. These I don't care about as much being invisible because these are on the inside of the band and netting is chaotic enough that I don't feel like it's visible very often. And then I have decided to do the gathers around the hem of the skirt after trying this on. I just think it'll add a nice little detail. So what I'm doing here is I am measuring every 18 inches and putting in a pin. From trying it on and playing with it, this seems like an appropriate amount of ruching ruffling, whatever you want to call it. And then once that pin is in, I am just hand stitching about like a quarter inch per stitch to put in that gathering line that's supposed to go about 10 inches up. And I am using my ruler under this for both measurement and to make it a little bit easier because I'm not stabbing my pin into fabric. And then once these are done, I am scrunching everything down to about an inch. The instructions say three quarters of an inch, but I went with an inch because it's easier. And I think it's okay if they're a little bit looser. And I've also decided to anchor the bows on these like the instructions say so. So I am tying nine little black bows out of some black velvet trim that I had to run to Michael's to go get, but luckily they were all 70% off. So really good for the budget, I guess here. And now I am stitching on those bows. So that's exciting. And this is the last thing I need to do before I show you the reveal. I'm so excited to show off this dress. It took a lot of work and I'm really proud of it. So let's hop to it. Alrighty, you have seen the reveal. I hope you enjoyed it. I also that night went to Seattle Frock Tales, which I'll talk about a little bit in the wrap up portion since I did wear the dress the whole event, but you've seen it. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a very fun reveal to film. I did try to take you to another location that had sunlight to try to get more of the sh color shift in the fabric. I felt like I couldn't get a good color shift effect showing at the location I filmed at. I waited a little too far into the evening where the sun wasn't shining in the spot that I knew I wanted to do the reveal. But yeah, hopefully you enjoyed, I guess, that dead hydrangea. But we are now going to hop into the cost breakdown and then the wrap up. When I go into the wrap up, I'll go into how the whole Frocktails event went in case you're curious because a lot of cities have them as well as how the dress fit and how I just generally feel about the project. As always, I have my spreadsheet for my cost breakdown. This was a pretty expensive project because I did use six yards of silk taffeta, which is going to cost a pretty penny. So the taffeta was $200 and then the spiderweb fabric was $89.25. The velvet I didn't put into this budget because it was like scrap fabric that I'd already used and put into a different project's budget. That brought me to a fabric total of $289.25. Like I said, very expensive because silk, of course. Wow, you got yourself very wet in your bowl. Okay. Yes, you're lucky, you're cute. Mm. Spooky was very around for this process, so it is only respectable, fair. It's, it's a good thing she's in the reveal because she, she added a lot to this process. 
or not the reveal, the wrap up. As far as notions, I spent $4.89 on thread, 96 cents on that zipper, and $3 on the velvet ribbon that I used on the overskirt. So that brought us to a total of $8.85. So the pattern in this case was actually free. This is actually a fun thing I didn't plan for Seattle Frocktails, but actually that pattern had been given to me for free through the like local Seattle sewing network because people know that I'm like the vintage pattern person. So they a lot of times offload vintage patterns to me. So this was part of a box I got for free from a friend. So I paid nothing for this pattern, which is wild because I've seen this pattern on Etsy and it's usually around $75. So, you know, talk about your sewing, make sure everybody knows you sewed and you too might be able to get some free patterns because a lot of people have relatives that die and they don't know what to do with their sewing supplies. Wow, that sounded really terrible. So that brought the total cost of this dress to $298.10. Not cheap, don't get me wrong, this is not a cheap dress, but considering the fact it is a two-piece silk ball gown. I think that is actually a more than fair price and like saved me money. I just kind of went to Google and searched comparatively to see if I could find any dresses on the market right now with this much silk taffeta in it. And any dresses I found on the market were minimum a thousand dollars. So the fact that I only paid about $300 for this makes this a lot cheaper. What I found is it actually often is not cheaper to sew your everyday clothes, but sewing formal clothes does seem to be significantly cheaper. Obviously like there's only so many uses. I made way too many gowns this year. This is the last gown of this year. I am putting my foot down, no more gowns. Yeah, I have definitely found when working with silk, specifically, even though silk fabric is super expensive, it's still significantly cheaper to buy silk and make a garment than it is to buy a silk garment of a similar caliber, if that makes sense. But again, I'm not, I'm not saying this is cheap. This is not cheap. $300 is wild. Anyway, from a labor perspective, this dress took a long time. It didn't take the three weekends as planned because I all of a sudden decided I want it done in time for frock tails. So I only did it for two weekends and a lot of evenings. The first dress, blue, and purple pretty shifty dress took me 13 hours. So not too shabby. Actually, that's not, I'm, I'm just kidding. That actually is a little bit shabby. I think that 13 hours, a lot of those hours was the hand stitching of the hem because that took a million years. The overskirt I was able to actually make in just four hours and 45 minutes. It's just so much easier to gather netting. I don't know that I will ever now do a taffeta dress that involves this much gathering again. I did not enjoy gathering the taffeta. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take a, our labor hours of 17 hours and 45 minutes and I'm gonna multiply that by $32.70, which is the thrivable, I guess I would say, wage in Seattle, which is a wage that not only do you have all your cost covered, but you also have a little bit of extra money to spend. I believe that everybody should make a thrivable, I guess, wage or bare minimum of living wage, but a thrivable wage because for a lot of different reasons, but a big part of those reasons is our CEOs, our top 1%, they're all wealth hoarding. We have enough money for everyone to live a decent life. It's just due to wealth hoarding at the top that we don't see that. That wealth hoarding particularly affects garment workers. A lot of garment workers aren't even paid a livable wage and there is a lot of forced labor that happens in the garment making industry. So I just always like to talk about that because I think it's really important to think about the fact that the reason that these people are able to make billions of dollars is because they are exploiting their workers, right? I have really like butchered talking about this in the past and I don't mean to sound too blamey or anything like that. And I apologize for the times I have. For me, when you sign off on like exploitative wages, you're saying you're totally cool with that company exploiting people and also you're cool, totally good with that company exploiting you. It's actually a big reason I don't do any brand partnerships despite the fact I do get reached out to is a lot of times if I push back on brands and I ask about their labor practices, even like are you hiring any other black influencers? Are you making sure you're paying them the same amount as you pay me? People don't answer that and they don't want to be honest or like talk about that. They don't want to work with an influencer who cares about those things. But ultimately for me, if they're willing to exploit their workers, they're willing to exploit me as well, right? So it's not just a selfless thing. It's also kind of selfish. A company that doesn't treat its workers ethically, I expect to be more likely to take my content and use it in ways that I don't allow them to. It's really easy to believe this exploitative labor that often is happening in other countries, which it does happen in the US by the way, but is often in other countries, doesn't impact you. But ultimately if those companies are exploiting their workers, they will exploit their customers. And I think that's also a really important thing to think of. Like think about the fact that Shein has had a lot of lead 
found in products that are like wearables, right? Like that to me is exploiting their customer because they're exploiting their customer's desire for cheapness and they're poisoning their customers, right? Allegedly, all of this is alleged. And so that's kind of the other, one of the angles I come at this with, but I know I can get a little bit preachy and a little bit blamey and I really do try to do my best to not. But anyway, back to this numbers where I'm multiplying 17 hours and 45 minutes by $32.70 an hour to get $580.43 for a paying a living wage if I was to have made this garment, I guess, for a company. So that brings a grand total of $878.53 for labor, supplies, the whole shebang. Actually, again, when I was looking online at comparable dresses, you're already paying probably about $1,200. So even if you were to, I guess, pay me a labor and we have no profit, which that is not a good business, you should always be building profit into your business model, it would still be about $1,200 for you to buy this gown. And often be wary still of like those higher end things because a lot of times they're still exploiting their workers and the garment workers aren't actually seeing that pay. At some point I should probably dig up a video that talks about how to tell if someone pays their workers. It's a very hard thing to tell. This little rant slash spiel has gone on long enough. Let's talk about what you probably really want to hear about which is Frocktails and the dress itself. So I wore the dress to Frocktails. I should probably go grab it but I have a little cat in my lap. I'm gonna say Spooky, get out of my lap. Oh, I know it's so hard to not snuggle me. Let's talk about the overskirt first, actually, before we dig into par crocktail, crocktails, <laughs> crocktails. Uh, so this is the overskirt. Um, it is boo spooky. Now I'm confusing my cat, both because of the ties and because I'm making her name in a funny voice. This is the overskirt. Honestly, I don't super love this overskirt. I just don't like it. I am sad about it. I, I do, once I put the bows on it, I definitely liked it a lot more. I'm gonna like experiment putting this piece over a few other things just to see if I can get like a fabric combination that I actually like with this. But if I can't, I'm actually just gonna save this skirt and I'm gonna reuse this fabric next year in more of the way that I use that spider web fabric a really long time ago. So you will probably see this again. So this is not a total lost cause. I am, like I said, I'm gonna experiment with a couple other pieces. I just don't know that I like it with this dress and I didn't end up wearing it to Frocktails, both because I didn't love it, also because I didn't want to like have my spooky season costume on. And the third is between these two pieces, I'd be wearing 12 yards of fabric and I just, Continents. It was 70 degrees out. It was way too warm. I was not doing 12 yards of fabric on my body. So I did not. And those are my thoughts on the overskirt. But let's talk about the dress itself that I did not zip up. Uh, so I wore this dress for five hours between taking my photos and then driving. It smells like perfume, which I do not wear perfume. So somebody I hugged was wearing perfume. So I wore this to the event. No complaints for the most part. I will say I found the boning a little pinchy when I sat down in it. So like I didn't super love it when I was driving or sitting at the tables, but it was fine while standing. I generally find this to be true on pieces that are boned that don't go down past closer to my hip curve. I have never been able to successfully find something with boning that doesn't feel pokey unless it's like fairly long line. So that was totally expected for me on this. And I will say this is a less pokey garment than some of my other garments. So I do think that there's a chance that I'm going to switch more to this featherweight boning because I've only ever used spiral steel boning, even though I've kept it and all that. This still, I think, was maybe a touch more comfortable. I will say I've made a good number of strapless dresses now. Making your own strapless dress, if you sew, is the way to go. The dresses that I've made that are strapless are the only strapless dresses I've ever worn that I am not pulling up all night. I did not, I think, pull this up like, you know, this move the whole night, which is a huge deal if you wear strapless. This is just maybe a slightly poofier skirt than I like. It works for a ball gown, but I wouldn't want it this poofy for like an everyday dress. So if I'm ever going to make this out of like a more normal fabric, I'm actually probably going to reduce the amount of fabric in it. I need to go in and re-up all of my stitching on this thing. Hopefully you can see that. It like kind of slid out through the night and I kept having to kind of adjust it and get it to sit right again. I am going to tack mo this down with a few more stitches, but otherwise I thought this wore very nicely throughout the night. Easy to use the bathroom in, overall pretty comfortable. I will say by the end of the night I was ready to not be in a boned garment anymore and I did unzip the side of the garment on my drive home. So yes, that does mean my boob was fully hanging out the side of my dress. Let me now real quick go into Frocktails. So Frocktails is actually an international thing. I know Australia, I think, has a few and I think a few places in the UK. And then I do know they happen all over the country here.
here in the US. So what Frocktails is, is it's getting together with a bunch of other people who sew, wearing a garment that you made and just celebrating, enjoying and socializing for the night. I really, really, really enjoyed this more than I thought. I had a lot of social anxiety before I went, which is funny because I'm so glad I went. Oh my gosh, spooky. Please don't stop my microphone. You can do anything else. I am not someone who goes out, so I do really appreciate going out with a bunch of sewers because I think we all don't super go out. I like to say it felt very feminine vibes and I met a lot of people. I was very, very proud of a lot of people who went there by themselves without knowing anyone. That is a big move and that's really hard to do. I think there's two people there who have YouTube channels and I'll link them down below. Neither are active right now, but I know both people desire having their channel active again someday. So I will link both of them down below. So I talked to them, I talked to a couple, I just, I know a lot of people because I've done retreats and if you're in the Seattle area, there's a Seattle sewing meetup group that I will also link down below. They have an Instagram. I go to most of their events that I can make it to that I'm in town for and they're so fun because what's really nice about Frocktails is even if you know no one, you all know you have something in common, right? Because you all made the outfit you're wearing and everyone sews for different reasons, but there's a lot of overlap. It was just like really fun and it's also really easy to meet people in that situation because you just have to ask them about their dress and what it's made out of. I've never been to an event like that where I touched so much fabric and so many people touched the fabric of my dress. I would like reach to like touch someone's dress while talking to them and I'd be like oh excuse me sorry I mean can I touch the fabric and it's so funny because I am not somebody who would ever do that at like a normal event like touch somebody else's clothes and it was just kind of funny throughout the night to watch everybody touch each other's fabric and then they did a runway where everybody showed off their garment and who wanted to with like a little announcement of like what it was made from and why they're proud of it. And I actually like am like hoarse this morning for cheering people on. I'm not gonna lie, I'm way too shy to do a runway like that, which I think is probably really funny because of the YouTube channel that I have. I didn't do it even though next year I definitely will or next time I go to one because people just cheered each other on and it was like just such vibrant and supportive vibes. I think I just was like intimidated and then by the time it was over, I was like, oh, I wish I did that. I feel like I was just a different person at this event because of like the passion I felt around me because like the fact that I'm hoarse today and a tiny bit hungover is just really funny to me because I'm like not somebody who cheers in an event. Like if I go to a sports game, I never cheer. If I go to a concert, I don't really cheer, but apparently if I go to a sewing party and everybody walks the runway, I'm a big cheerer. I was so excited to pump each everybody up because there were just so many fabrics, so many patterns. It was just, it was so cool. Definitely go to a frocktail if you get the opportunity to. I did wrongfully get a parking ticket. So I am um, working on my dispute email and I dispute every parking ticket I get. You can usually get it knocked off if not to go away completely. But in this case, it was a glitch in their software. So I'm really, really pissed and I'm actually gonna see if I can see them get them not only to like get rid of my parking ticket but to pay me back my parking parking that I paid because I paid my parking at that lot I would never park in a lot in that part of town for three hours on a Friday night and not pay that would be a wild choice so I was a little salty it did not ruin my evening I'm not gonna lie I love writing a petty email it is delightful. My um, sewing related tip of the night of the day of right now is always dispute a parking ticket. Never let that lie because you never know. You never know what you're going to get back out of disputing that parking ticket and a lot of times it's great. I think that wraps up my thoughts on the stress on Fractales and I just like I'm definitely riding a high from Fractales right now so I'm feeling very peppy and hungover at the same time. So I hope you enjoyed this make. As always if you want to you can buy me a coffee over on Kofi. I put a lot, a lot, a lot of time and effort and money into my channel and you guys pretty much get this content for free. I mean, you do have to watch ads, which but otherwise it's basically free so I always really appreciate a tip or buying me a coffee and then other than that you can of course support me in the usual ways by giving this video a thumbs up commenting down below if you've ever been to Frocktails I'd love to know your experience and then of course if you're new here subscribe and stick around I would love to have you I put out a sewing video every other week and then a different type of video every other other week that is not a sewing video. So stay tuned for all of that. And I will see you next week at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Bye.